By now, I, I expect most everyone, or maybe everyone in this room, already knows all the spiritual words. Right? And you know the spiritual lifestyle. And you know the, the spiritual uh, philosophy, whatever branch that takes. But do you know the truth? That's the question. It's the hardest question of a lifetime. Because everything in the mind will corrupt everything that points to the truth to make it justify living a lie. And we've all lived lies to different degrees. And certainly if you look at our human ancestry, we've all lived lies to horrible degrees. So when there arises in a human lifetime this mysterious grace of actually wanting to know the truth and not being satisfied with another spiritual philosophy or spiritual words or even spiritual good feelings, as satisfying as all those are, recognizing that's not enough. I have to know the truth. And then, of course, you are drawn to people who are speaking the truth. And naturally what happens is that the words are taken. And maybe they're new words, maybe they're the same words, but they're learned. And they're spoken. But it's still not the truth. And so there's left this uh, hunger. I mean, we have all, at this point, or most people in here have heard about self-inquiry, which is really what Ramana, my teacher's teacher, offered. Who am I? Who dies? And this is so powerful, so profound. It's the essential question, who am I? But it's so easily corrupted by the mind so that it becomes a way of avoiding the lie of one's life. Who am I? Well, I am, in an instant, you can recognize the limitless consciousness. No one separate from consciousness. And if that's then overlaid on a life lived in betrayal to that, then there's still suffering. Then inquiry itself has become co-opted by the mind. And we're experts at that. We have to really be willing to tell the hard truth about the power we have to corrupt the most pure, the most sublime recognition of truth, reality, oneself. And you can't do it through the mind because the mind gets very busy being involved in damage control, <laughs> as you know. Here's a question you can ask, though, and you can uh, deeply examine it and ruthlessly, often painfully, tell the truth about it. And that is, what does my life stand for? What is my life standing for? What has it stood for? what is the deepest call for my life to stand for. Then all you have to do is really look very carefully, ruthlessly, to see. And you will see if you are speaking words of truth and living a life of a lie, you will see that. And it's a painful seeing and the mind will immediately make the lie itself some form of truth. So it's a rigorous truth-telling. And as we are all macrocosms of each other, what has to be examined, it really has to be examined, is profoundly uncomfortable. 
It's the rapist, the killer, the child molester, the fascist, the Nazi, the abuser of power, the false teacher. It's all alive within us. And if we are willing to face that and actually meet that as however it is being reflected in this lifetime, this particular lifetime, then there's a possibility of what the Christians call redemption. But true redemption, like Christ's redemption on the cross, to in an instant or an hour or a week or a year or a lifetime, however long it takes, bear the pain that we, is, we have caused as human beings in the name of truth, in the name of love, in the name of service. It's that bearing of that without indulging it, without indulging it, without repressing it, that then reveals a space for real inquiry. Otherwise, inquiry is just a, a layer on top, uh, another way of escaping, a way of feeling good. And you know that. And you know the, the nectar of that and the addiction of that. And yet, there is a call within you that wants the truth, or you wouldn't be here. Because you know I have nothing to teach you. I'm not teaching you anything. Really. I'm inviting you to examine at the deepest level who you are. And that begins at the most superficial level. And in the willingness to see the most superficial, there is a strength and a capacity to actually see deeper. And in that, there's a strength and a bigger capacity to see deeper until finally you're faced with seeing yourself as nothing at all. And that's horrifying to the mind because the mind's job is to make you something. And this nothing is at all is not a something. It's not an enlightened something. It's not an awake something. It's not a happy something. It is nothing at all. And paradoxically, that nothing at all is filled with bliss and fulfillment and satisfaction of the most profound level. And that's self-recognition. After that, the mind may arise. Assume it will arise. It's a very skillful assumption. It's very unskillful to assume it won't arise. Assume it will arise and make claim to that also. I am nothing. I am nothing at all. <laughs> you laugh because you know it, right? Yes. So this is the, the razor's edge that Papaji used to talk about. You know it is wonderful to be together and chant together and experience the love. This is essential. It's the nectar that gives us the power actually to examine what does my life stand for. But if we become intoxicated with the nectar, ultimately, even though we have a life of nectar, which is highly pleasurable, we aren't satisfied at the deepest levels. 